This conference will now be recorded.
Good morning, everyone. So this is Sophia Vicente Ortiz. And we have about 18 attendees so far. Um, I'll give everyone about a minute or two just to get settled in. Um, we'll be using the chat box to respond to questions. So please make sure you remain on mute so that we don't get a lot of background noise and everyone's able to hear the audio clearly. Okay, everyone, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, is there a way? Oh, okay, so Glenn Scorza is asking if there's a way to get a link to FDOT's file transfer application. Uh, we can send that after the webinar, that's not a problem. That might be from reviewing the guidance where we talk about it. Sure, yeah, yeah absolutely. So it really depends. We'll talk about the guidance that we sent yesterday um, and we'll go into a, a pretty good amount of detail on that. Um, but basically the purpose of today's call is for us to provide better instructions than what we've been able to provide in the past with regards to direct cost invoicing um, for your grant agreements. We know that it's been um, it's been it's it's been an issue only because um, we've been getting uh, invoices pushed back from our district financial services. Um, but we hope that after today's call and having the process written um, after a series of meetings with our financial services that we'll be able to get to a place where um, invoices will be easily reimbursed. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So today, okay, so today we'll go over the process overview uh, we'll go over the various forms that we sent over in that process yesterday. Um, we're not, we're going to discuss expense documentation, but we're really going to focus on the three documents um, that are forwarded to our district financial services. Um, they're basically, they're basing the reimbursement, the eligibility of the reimbursement on those three forms alone. So while we'll continue to, ex to receive expense documentation, um, we are not going to be, that's not going to be part of the review process for reimbursing the invoice. So uh, we'll talk about that and then we'll talk about submission requirements. And, you know, just as a refresher, uh, I know that you guys have seen this graphic before, but just so you understand a little bit more about the award process, uh, first you, of course, submit your grant application, um, then we go through the award notification process. We develop the contract mechanism in which you receive your reimbursement, then that contract gets executed. Once the contract gets executed, you are able to invoice uh, for expenses that are eligible under that grant, uh, but only after for expenses incurred after the PTGA was executed. Um, then, of course, after you've expended the funds on the grant, you are able to close out the project. And there is a process for that. We're not going to go into detail today about that um, because I don't believe that that information is relevant to any of you right now, um, but at a later date we will. And as I go through, um, please feel free to put in questions in the chat box so you don't forget what your question is at that very moment and we can address it when we feel it's appropriate. Um, also in the room with me here today is Kayla Finch. Diane Poitras and Carlos Colon. And then we also have other, other consultant support, Brendan Guest and Jarrell Smith. So I'd like to just remind you guys that when, when, you're, um, when you're developing your documentation for your 
invoices, it's really good to go over your uh, PTGA over and over again. This is the mechanism in which you know, funds are awarded. Um, this is the only way that we're able to reimburse any funds without a contract in place. We would not be able to do that. So um, this is the mechanism in which we're able to reimburse the funds. So it's very important that you reference the, the PTGA for the various invoice components. Um, such as FM number, execution date, expiration date, things like that. And Diane and Kayla, feel free to jump in if you feel like I'm missing anything. <clears throat> so again, um, from your PTGA in regards to the invoicing requirements, um, you are required to submit at least on a quarterly basis uh, but no more often than a monthly basis. So we understand that um, that there may not be enough activity on a monthly basis and it could be very difficult, especially given if you have a lot of open projects with the department. Um, however, we do encourage and it is required per the PTGA that you submit on a, on a quarterly basis. Um, with regards to supporting documentation, uh, while we are not going to be reviewing the expense documentation or the supporting documentation um, with every invoice that you submit. Please be aware that we at the district are subject to audits and we will be pulling a percentage of invoices and, and periodically uh, reviewing the, the backup documentation for eligible costs and for consistency with regards to you know, the expenses incurred in that period and what was reimbursed under that invoice. So um, what that means for you guys is that um, you may be getting notifications from the district moving forward periodically, letting you know that we audited a portion of your invoices um, or the invoice backup documentation and maybe we noticed that there was an amount that was incorrectly applied to the grant and we may have to do a memorandum of understanding to um, subtract that from your next from your next invoice. So um, just letting you know that just because you're submitting the, the expense documentation and we're not reviewing it at the time of uh, reimbursement, it is gonna undergo review at some point. <coughs> Excuse me. So exhibit B in the PTGA is important because we need to make sure we remind ourselves of the phases that were <clears throat> the project phases that were awarded under each project. Um, this will be used to populate the invoice form when you submit your invoices to the DOT. Um, it basically outlines your project budget and any eligible expense categories. So keep in mind that if you did not submit for, for example, contractual services, and you don't have an amount allocated in your budget in this line item, that is not gonna be an eligible cost under the PTGA. However, if you reach out to your district um, uh, project coordinator for this grant, they can make an adjustment to the, the budget and, and move the funds around so that you can use it um, for that phase. Keep in mind, <laughs> excuse me, keep in mind that you are only able to um, expend funds on that line item after the budget revision. So let's say your PTGA is executed in January, you realize you wanna move funds around on your budget in March, you go through the budget revision process at the beginning of April, you are not then allowed to invoice for that budget revision amount for the months of January through March, only from the time that the budget revision was, was finalized. <clears throat> Another important thing to keep in mind is uh, the procurement process. The procurement process applies to all the costs that are submitted to the district. Um, so the direct cost methodology when submitting invoices really allows 
the district to have a full understanding of what expenses are being incurred under each grant and to understand um, and to and to apply an approval process to that procurement and that or that cost. Um, so <clears throat> if you have not received a procurement pr pr approval for a cost being expended on a grant and you submit the invoice for that, they are going to ask you to submit the applicable procurement forms so that they can go through the approval process. Excuse me one second. <coughs> so in terms of the invoice components, um, <clears throat> invoices are really going to be made up of three forms and your expense documentation. So the first form is the invoice form. There is one form for capital and one form for operating. Make sure that you're submitting the applicable form with the applicable costs. So if it's an operating PTGA, then you submit, <clears throat> then you submit your operating form. And likewise, if you have capital expenditures under a PTGA, you would submit the capital invoice form. Summary of costs. Uh, the summary of costs is something that was developed at the district level to be able to support your documentation that you're submitting for invoices. Um, the project monitoring status report has been an interesting <laughs> experience, uh, we, uh, but it has to be submitted with each of the invoices. Um, and then of course, depending on what option you select, if you want to attach any additional information to that uh, project monitoring form, you would attach the summary of project outcomes that's if applicable, you can decide to not do so. And then of course, there's the expense documentation. Um, we have changed the format in which we're accepting the expense documentation. And again, this is for auditing purposes. Now that we're not accept, now that we're not reviewing backup documentation with each invoice submitted, it's, it's vitally important that we um, have the expense documentation organized in a fashion that can allow us to respond to auditors in a timely fashion and, and have the correct answers. So let's go over the, um, the operating invoice form. So the operating invoice form at the top has your very you know, general information. Um, it's very important that you that this information matches what is on your PTGA. So if you're, let's say, operating out of three different locations, um, you would use the, ad the address, which is the main office that manages the grant files. And, and ideally, that's the same address that's on your PTGA. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, then, of course, you want to include your, your um, project coordinator information, and we have uh, provided the contact information there as well. Um, you want to include the invoice number. Now, the invoice number can be a sequential invoice number or it can be an agency-defined format, but it cannot exceed eight digits. This is really important because we have, we have gotten uh, invoices kicked back for an agency submitting an invoice that had an invoice number that exceeded the eight digits. So just keep that in mind. You guys can come up with whatever format um, you think is appropriate. It just has to be, um, cannot exceed the eight digits. Eight characters. Eight char or eight characters. Yeah, yeah. They can it be could alphanumeric. Be, they could be alphanumeric. Thank you guys. Um, for the contract number, this is something that you're also <clears throat> gonna find in your PTGA. It's on the first page. Your amendment number, if the contract has been amendment, you wanna include, has been amended, you wanna include the amendment number. If it has not, you would, you would put in NA. The FM number is also located on the executed PTGA. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the allowable costs incurred. So this is where the, this is where this form gets a little interesting because um, the way that it calculates the well, it just doesn't actually. It doesn't calculate the revenues 
um, when you're deducting the revenues from the um, amount requested for FDOT grants. So um, we have set up a the project summary sheet, which is an Excel spreadsheet. It's a source. We can provide the source file if you if you wish to use it. Um, in the guidance that we provided yesterday, it was uh, just a basic PDF. Um, but what we did with the summary form is we set up a formula that calculates uh, it weights the um, the collected revenue versus the current invoice amount requested and takes off the top a proportionate amount. Um, so you're basically going to transpose the numbers <clears throat> in the summary sheet into this table. And if you review the instructions, you'll be able to see where you can include that information, where the appropriate information goes with color coded. We'll go over it here in a little bit. Um, is there anything in this form that I'm missing, Kayla? Can you, because I think we're going to cover it in the project summary. Yeah, I think that's it. I will say though that it's important that when you submit this form, you include all the project phases that have line items in your project budget that's in your PTGA, as I previously mentioned. <coughs> now for your capital invoice form, it's it's the, the same. There's not really much any, anything different here. Um, in this situation, there wouldn't be any uh, revenue collected, so you're not going to be deducting any revenue. Um, so you, this is a pretty simple, straightforward form and it, it requires a lot of the same information. So unless anyone has any specific, okay. Um, we have a question from Glenn and he's saying, are you saying that Yes, there is an, not an Excel version of the invoice form, but an Excel version of the summary form, which I'm going to show you next, um, where you can, where it has the formulas that you can use it to, to get to the figures that you need to include onto the invoice form. <clears throat> so really important on the invoice form is that the invoice period that we're referring to is the period in which you provided service. So, <coughs> excuse me, it is not the period in which the expenses were incurred. Um, because remember, if you're, we're not submitting backup documentation to our financial services, they're not interested in understanding or knowing when the expenses were incurred. They're only interested in understanding the, the the period of service that was provided for the for where this cost is coming from. Yeah, and the way that we've been um, guided to think of it, and I think we've said this at other workshops, mm -hmm. is um, the department looks at the contract between the department and your agency as like a vendor relationship. Um, so if you're providing a service in exchange for the department's reimbursement, um, think of it as you're providing any other service like HVAC maintenance or something like that. You're providing service by providing transportation service to the public. So that's the documentation that financial services is interested in. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Kayla. <clears throat> I know it's it's difficult for a lot of us to remove ourselves from that mindset because we've been submitting backup documentation for so many years and we've been reviewing the backup documentation, but um, since the district financial services is encouraging the department transit not to include backup documentation yes yes um that if we reference any any dates outside of the service periods it can it can lead to confusion from the reviewers on the financial um services side and then that will that will kind of almost ensure that the the invoice gets pushed back Okay. So summary of project cost. Oh, so let's see. We have a question. So to clarify. Not the, no, not the not, not the, the cost incurred date, but the date it was paid, right? 
date. So the inv invoice period date should be the period that you provided the transportation service. Services. So if you paid for fuel ahead of time before the invoice period date, that doesn't you'd still you'd want to do it for the time that the services were provided, even if you prepared by purchasing whatever operating mm -hmm. um, supplies you needed then you would still make the invoice period date the dates of service provided, not mm -hmm. back to the first expense the way right. that we may have done in the past. Right, that's right. kind of a major change. That yeah. is, yeah, that is the biggest change. Perfect. So uh, this is the, pro the summary of project costs that was developed at a district level. Um, and basically what we've done here is we've, <coughs> excuse me, we've duplicated the invoice form, um, but allowed for there to be formulas for you to um, calculate the items that go into that same table. So we understand that that other form, um, the calculations don't work as they should. Um, so we believe that we've solved this issue for you. Um, now, the year like what's going on with this color coding right <laughs> so basically the blue fields are the ones where you want to put in your information the yellow or the yellow orangey type fields are the fields that are already calculated for you so you're going to only plug in um, the columns that say ptga amount previously billed and then this invoice and then you're going to take the column that says current invoice amount requested for FDOT and bring it into this page, which is the fourth column from the right where it says current invoice amount requested from FDOT. So the titles match. Yes. The two columns. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else that we need to add about this one? Where would they put the revenue? Where do they enter their revenue so it makes that calculation? Yeah. So they but so we may need to make another blue um, because they will need to enter the amount of the revenue so mm -hmm. that it can be applied for the right. but it once you enter it it automatically calculates correct. for you. Right. The revenue column, um, the, the column labeled revenue has the formula calculation that allocates the revenue amount across each project phase line item by the proportion that that line item represents of this invoice, um, but you will need to enter your overall revenue amount. Um, right and there. when we set right. the guidance after, we'll have that highlighted blue. Yeah, we can update that to be highlighted blue so it's more clear. So the um, transit grant project monitoring form, um, this is required with each invoice. So um, you would basically generate the information, the basic information um, up at the top using your PTGA for, um, for in some instances, oh, one second. Let's see, we have a question. that cost would just go into your, okay, so the question is, um, in terms of the billing periods, if they have costs in the following month, how would they report that in this period? And you would just, re you, you're, only, you're only reporting the period in which you provided service. So it, it doesn't matter when the costs were incurred. Um, you would submit that backup documentation with, the, with your next period, and include that cost there, but the the dates of the of the actual invoicing period are the dates that you provided service. So, for example, if you provided service January 1st through the the 30th or the 31st, um, you would that would be your invoice period, and whatever expenses are were eligible under your program would go into that period. And when you submit your backup documentation, you would include all of the expenses right, you're requesting. It's on requesting. a cost reimbursement basis anyway. So when did you pay the bill? If you paid the bill in May, then that's when you would include it in the May invoice, even if you purchased it or in April, but you paid the bill in May. Correct. 
Okay, so we had a couple of questions. Um, Tom asked, where can we get the Excel summary of project cost sheet? Um, so after our meeting today, we'll make a couple of updates, including, you know, highlighting the revenue, and then we'll send to the group the Excel version of the summary sheet. So right now you just have it in PDF form for review, uh, but that Excel sheet will have the formulas embedded that will, should make it easier to do the calculations. Um, so then the next question from Glenn is, so for fuel, it would be the transactions for January. Can you give us an example? I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, Glenn. I missed the context of. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm saying if, if you have, <coughs> I'm sorry, if you have fuel expenses and you purchased it in January, it, it doesn't matter when you bill for it because you could bill for it under a July invoice. You just submit that backup documentation with the invoice, but the dates of the invoice would still be only the dates in which you provided service. And I think this is going to become a little bit more clear when I explained to you guys the text that we provided in the sample document for the project monitoring form, because it's like what Kayla said, you're basically, when you're submitting an invoice to the department, you're submitting it almost as if you were a contractor providing professional services and you're, you're explaining to the district what deliverables they're receiving in exchange for the grant reimbursement funds. So think of it as you submitting an invoice, basically it's submitting a, a professional services invoice. You're kind of just updating the, the district on what you did during that period, not the expenses incurred. Because for a, a professional services invoice, you wouldn't so you wouldn't submit the date of a, a fringe benefits or something like that. You're only um, explaining that what deliverables you achieved during that period. Okay, I hope that makes things a little bit more clear. But let's go through the, the, the project monitoring status form. I have one more comment sure. on um, the dates. So the if you purchase fuel for, to deliver service um, before the start of the PTGA, before mm -hmm. the PTGA was executed, um, that expense could not be included. Thank you, as your backup documentation. Yes. Yes. And even if you're still using that fuel to provide the service during the invoice period, right. you just wouldn't be able to include that right. in the amount that you're requesting. For right. Reimbursement. That goes. That that just speaks to the if the, whatever costs were incurred prior to the execution of the PTGA are not eligible. So. If we, you know, happen to, and we hope to establish a percentage of methodology soon in which we'll be auditing our invoices <laughs> on a quarterly basis, excuse me, um, when we pull those forms, if we see an expense that incurred prior to the PTGA execution, that is an eligible expense and we'll have to issue a memorandum of understanding to deduct that from your next invoice. So definitely want to avoid that. Um, you know, with this group, we haven't seen a, a, a lot of submittals of ineligible expenses. Um, the pushback that we've been getting from financial services has been more related to the, the you know, tweaks in the backup documentation or the language or, or the, the dates on the invoice. And, and that actually brings me to a, a really important point is that in the past, your district project coordinators um, have been able to make minor edits to the forms um, in our conversations with, with I'm going to call them the powers that be. Um, they have communicated that that is no longer acceptable, whether it's a, a minor, you know, a penny off or a change of date or um, a misspelling or something that's, you know, just an inconsistency. Um, we no, will no longer be able to make those changes at this level. They will have to get sent back to the agency for those. So um, just try to be more aware and um, so that we can avoid, yeah, yeah. just proofread, mm -hmm. check your numbers, check your dates, reread the PTGA, that helps a lot. Um, okay, so in terms of the project description, um, you're going to get that from your PTGA. Um, invoice attached, you want to select yes, because that's that's the purpose of the, this form. Um, the progress report attached, you're going to select no. 
some of these instructions may not be intuitive um, right so just re reference your guidance as you're right. going along <coughs> thank you kayla uh projects uh photos attached you're going to select not applicable the start of the agreement um, you want to make sure, again, to reference your PTGA, the expiration date, make sure to look to see if there's been any extensions of the existing agreement. Um, don't miss that because if there's been an extension um, and that date is of the original PTGA and we send it up to financial services, let's say we don't catch it here at this level, they're going to push it back and then we have to send it back to you. Um, then the total FDOT grant amount um, is your total award amount. And then this is, so Kayla, could you, because we've had some, so this is the previous amount paid. Yeah, so the field that says total previous amount paid for FDOT grant, that would be the amount that your agency has been reimbursed for all other invoices under this same contract, right. excluding the current invoice that you're submitting this form with. I think that's, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kayla. <laughs> um, yeah, right. as, you can, yeah. as you guys can probably tell, there's been a lot of conversation about this field. Yeah. Um, okay. And then the estimated percent complete is based on the previous amount paid for FDOT. So just make sure that you're deducting that amount from the percentage of the project's completion. That's clear, hopefully. If you guys have questions, please let us know. Um, on section two, this is another counterintuitive field. Um, so, okay. So on section two, what we've been encouraged to do is to not put an X on any of these fields, but to, <laughs> but to um, go into the field to the right of where details include is, and then press enter. And then in this description, you're only going to include, uh, uh, you know, one to two sentence description of the services that were provided in the reporting period. So we provide the example of a 5311 grant um, for this made up Sunshine County uh, system where they provided 5,215 trips in the rural areas of Sunshine County. Some agencies are submitting a one-page summary report, which is still acceptable as well. Correct. So if you look at the guidance that we submitted, that we sent out yesterday, um, there there is also the other option of including an, an attachment and the process outlines how you can do so. Um, just make sure that when you're submitting that attachment, that the dates of reporting match the dates that are in this form as well as your invoice form. Because, you know, when you're attached, you're more than welcome to attach things, and it, we're not encouraging one way or another. It just makes sure that it's consistent, you know, to the, the other forms that you're submitting. Um, the work anticipated for the next period, um, just you know, a one sentence description for in this case this uh, this agency is using 5311 to provide paratransit trips in the rural area that is the description provided so they're going to continue doing so any problem areas no problem areas if you have any issues um, please reach out to your fdot project coordinator prior to submitting the the, the status report um, and then the, the rest is pretty self-explanatory. Oh, and make sure you sign it. <laughs> oh, yes. Please sign your forms before they are submitted to us. <laughs> uh, this is the, the, the form that uh, Diane was referring to, option number two in the process that we sent out yesterday. Um, we just provided a, a template um, for which you can, you can uh, include a more detail if you so desire. Now, if you were to include this option, you just put C attached in the, in, in section number two, where it says details include, you said, you say C attached and don't put anything else. And then you would uh, attach this summary of project outcomes. You can't check the box where it says in agency format. 
No. No, they told us not to check the oh. C agency mm -hmm. format. Well, yeah. some, some of them have been going through that way. Well, it just depends on the, the invoice reviewers in the, the land. Okay. We found it safer. Yeah. Not to check. Not to check. Yeah. So, um, so I've I've mentioned to you guys a few times that we're not going to be submitting, <coughs> excuse me, backup documentation to our district financial services, but let me be clear that this does not mean that we are not going to be expecting backup documentation from agencies with each invoice. Um, we are going to keep that here um, at, at the transit level um, and be prepared for to be prepared for audits. So um, when submitting your expense backup documentation, we have uh, developed a project phase separator, um, which you're going to use to as a, as a cover sheet for each of your individual budget line items. Um, in the project phase separator, you're going to include a summary. And we have the source document for you guys that we'll send to you after this webinar, um, where you're going to summarize each of the expenses incurred. The expenses incurred should, after this cover sheet, should go in order as they appear. And this will just allow us to be able to go through the auditing process uh, in a more efficient, streamlined manner. Um, it's not just easier for us, it's easier for you guys. If we have it in this in this format, we're, we're not gonna be reaching out to you guys with a million questions. Um, the other important thing is that the backup documentation has to be legible. It's really important that we can read um, what expenses were incurred and we're able to match the amounts here in the project phase separator to the documentation submitted of that expense. Um, and of course, backup documentation includes an invoice for services um, and then the, the, the documentation that reflects that your agency incurred the costs and paid it, correct, yes. Um, let's see, am I forgetting anything on this? No, I think, okay, okay. So just going over this, the general submission requirements, <coughs> you will talk to your um, project coordinator, you know, Diane, Carlos, or Joe, about how you're going to submit the invoices, whether they're going to be via um, mail or electronic invoices uh, via email. It's important that you consult with your DOT pro uh, project coordinator on their preferred method. Um, make sure, like I said before, that all the documents are legible. Um, we've gotten a lot of kickback um, from financial services about this, you know, in, in terms of auditing, there's no way that we can audit something that we can't read. So just review the quality of your scans if you're submitting them electronically. Um, review the size of the fonts that you're using when pulling reports. Um, all of that definitely helps. <coughs> When you're submitting, of course, as, as has been standard, <clears throat> no staples, no single-sided, or single-sided printing only, and eight and a half by 11 paper. Um, and then, you know, if you're gonna mail or use a file transfer application, again, we can provide that file transfer application link, but first you need to talk to your FDOT project coordinator to make sure that that's how they wanna receive your, your, uh, your invoice. So just a quick, like in review, um, make sure that when you're submitting your invoices that you're reviewing the PTGA for consistency, look at those execution dates, look at the grant award, um, look at the, the expiration date, make sure you're looking at any amendments that have taken place or time extensions. Um, ensure that the invoice period is consistent across all of your forms, especially if you're using that attachment um, to the, the, the project monitoring status form. If you're using that attachment, you want to make sure that the, the, that the dates are consistent. Um, check your math to avoid any rounding errors. Like I said before, we're not going to be able to make changes at this level before sending them 
to financial services for reimbursement, um, we will have to send them back to you. The backup documentation should be organized and you know, just think of yourself, if you were preparing for an auditor, how would you prepare for an auditor? We'd like you to submit invoices in that same fashion. And then just keep an open line of communication with your FDOT project coordinator um, as issues arise. Um, all right, I mean, that, that, pretty, that pretty much um, sums it up. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, Kayla, myself, and Jarrell will be available if you have any questions. And I'm going to actually open it up for questions now if, if anyone oh, wants to. Well, tell them it's a new process and it could still be subject to change. Oh, absolutely. Minor changes. Yeah. Um, the, and, and so everyone's clear. Also, we received an email from our central office stating that the PTGA process, the contract mechanism, uh, just opened up for comments. Um, we don't expect there to be any drastic changes, but there may be minor tweaks in the next six months to a year. So as always, you know, this is an evolving, ever-changing world we live in. And thanks for bearing with us. And, you know, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, now I'll kind of, I'll open up the, the, the chat box if anyone has any follow-up questions to what we just discussed. Have I <laughs> say I if I've completely confused everyone? Okay. Well, thank you everyone for your time, and it looks like we don't have any. <coughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, sorry, guys. We oh. definitely didn't. Oh, look at that. Oh dear. Our <laughs> chat box was not updating. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Our sincere apologies, but now we'll catch up. Oh, Glenn had one. Oh, go back up. Okay. Glenn's okay. was about, I think we clarified on the invoice. Yeah, but he yeah. had one about the. Yeah, I, I think that was still about the oh, okay. invoice dates where he was asking about the January fuel. Yeah, and I think yeah. we talked about that. Okay, so Tom Wilder's question is if we pay our fuel bill in March, but may include some February expenses, Will we ask for reimbursement in the March billing when it was paid? As long as you're not duplicating expenses from one invoice to the next. So if you had $5,000 in fuel expenses in February and you have some additional ones in March, just make sure you're not carrying over that the same expenses, the same expenditures from your February into your March invoice. So if you had expenditures of an additional $2,000 in March, you would submit that as long as you're not duplicating, if you only submit a portion of your February expenditures um, with that invoice and you need to submit the other portion in March, that's fine, as long as we don't see any uh, duplication of expenses. Okay, so we'll, um, we'll take a tally of who's on the line today and make sure that we send out all the documentation as well as the source documentation that we referenced during today's discussion. Yes, we can send out a copy of the presentation after the webinar. Um, yes, this, um, so Susan McGrath asked if this guidance is for invoices moving forward. And yes, it is moving forward from mm -hmm. today. Yeah, because we may have confused everyone by changing the forms recently, but um, we're going back to this other form. And, but the summary of project cost page should correct some of the revenue issues that yes. we're having. Yes. So not clear on the dates. OK. We'll, we'll work to clarify in the written guidance um, just to make it crystal clear yeah. and when we send our follow-up. Yeah. 
I don't know if anyone has any ideas for phrasing it better than we have. Right? Glenn, and, and we could have a sidebar conversation. And, you know, if if um, if anyone is unclear on the dates, we, we can definitely have the discussion um, one on one as well. Yes. yes, yes, all three dates should be the same on yeah. each form. So Glenn's question is, should the dates be consistent across all three forms? And the answer is yes, the dates should be consistent on all of the forms that are submitted for the invoice. So the question is, um, so to clarify, we'll be using these forms for this quarter reporting period rather than the previous forms. Yes. Yes. <coughs> these are the forms that you should use from here forward. I think that's it. Okay. Well, I think we've answered everyone's questions so far. Um, Glenn, do we still submit the old invoice format? Um, so Glenn, the answer to that is no. We're using the invoice format that um, was issued with the guidance yesterday. So that's and, the new invoice form. And the reason why we went back to the old invoice form is because we faced the challenge of being able to deduct the revenue um, in a way that was acceptable and, and made sense. Um, we found a way to work around that with the project summary sheet, a spreadsheet that we're going to send out. So as long as you are able to reflect the accurate numbers that you're expecting reimbursement on, deducting the, the project revenues, then we can uh, we can use the new form. So we're going to use the new form. So the question is um, that we mentioned the change starts from today. I'm preparing the August invoice. Does this start now? So any invoices yes. moving submitted from today moving forward? Yes. Yes, um, yes. So the next question from Promise is, should payroll reports be included as backup with the, these invoices? And the answer is yes, um, that would be included. For salaries, yes. Right. Yes. So if a component of your payroll report is being requested for reimbursement, then that should be your expense backup documentation. And I think that's it, unless we get another flurry. but. Um, if you have questions, just follow up with any one of us and we'll be happy to help. Well, thank you guys for your time today and you will you can expect the, um, the process, the presentation, and the source documentation uh, shortly after this call. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.